So, so the nice thing about uh, the setup is, right, mammography is pre predominantly a radiographic technique, but there's some, so following it from, with these other talks uh, works, works very nicely. I, I don't have to repeat a bunch of things we just talked about. But there are some very special differences in mammography, and that's really what this talk is aimed at emphasizing. So, you know, about one in eight women will develop breast cancer during their lifetime. In the U.S., the 2017 estimates from the National Cancer Institute are in the range of 250,000 new cases and 40,000 deaths. And those numbers have been fairly stable over the last 10 years. The number of deaths is dropping about 1.8% uh, a year or so, which, which is nice. But the number of new cases is staying about the same. And certainly, right, if you're going to screen, you, you, you've really got to be able to have some treatment. And we, we think that breast cancer, if detected early, is, is curable. Um, and so, therefore, we, we screen. You know, there's little controversy in postmenopausal women, um, 50 to 75 or so. Uh, the evidence is really strong. You know, there's still some controversy, and so therefore it can be a little confusing. You know, the U.S. Preventative Health Task Force is recommending something slightly different than ACR is recommending. And if you think about it, as the incidence of breast cancer goes down in a particular age group, right, the benefits of screening change, the threshold benefits for screening change. So it's not surprising that there's some controversy at the lower age, right, for potential screening for, for mammography. And I don't really want to get into that other than to say, yes, there are no uniform screening standards out there, right? There's still some controversy about when to start and whether annual or every, every two years is most appropriate. So what about mammography is so important, you know, compared to or so different than what we've already talked about that it, it requires me to kind of do a separate talk and regard that? Well, the task is, is much more challenging, right? We need exceedingly good spatial resolution. I mean, we've got to see microcalcifications in the range of a tenth to, you know, two tenths of a millimeter in size. And so to do that, we use a special film screen combination if you're using film, or you use digi dedicated digital detectors that have much higher resolution than the flat panel detectors that we use in other areas of imaging. We're going to use an x-ray tube that has a much smaller focal spot, and we're going to use some magnification views as well to really help uh, do a better job in that. We really need excellent contrast resolution, right? We've got to see the minimal attenuation difference between normal glandular tissue and breast cancer. And that, that, that's a little strong in, in that, right, I, I don't want to th think that breast cancers are necessarily detected by looking at attenuation differences in particular structures, right? Um, the architectural distortion that occurs is, is if equally important, if not more important than that. But how do we make sure that we get the best possible contrast resolution? Well, we're going to use that low KVP technique, right? The nice thing with the breast is that we, it's not like that x-ray where we were shooting across my pelvis and we had 30 centimeters of tissue that we had to go through, right? So we can get down to a lower KV technique and maximize the probability of those photoelectric interactions. We're going to use compression. That's going to minimize the scatter for us. We're going to use a grid, which also is going to help us minimize some scatter. We're going to use specialized films and digital detectors. And of course, uh, we're going to use uh, more and more these days using tomosynthesis to do that. So here's a curve, right? Here's glandular tissue, the circle. Um, here's adipose tissue. Here's olive oil. These are the linear attenuation coefficients. And you can see that when you get above 30, 35 keV, average energy of the x-ray beam, you can hardly separate some of these structures from each other. So we really need to be operating down in this range where there's some difference in terms of the linear attenuation characteristics. And then in terms of noise, right? Low noise is required uh, for accurate detection of some of the subtle contrast differences between these small structures. And again, we're going to do this with the appropriate MAS, the balance between noise and dose, and compression that reduces the breast thickness. And I really want to emphasize this compression, right? Remember, I, I, yesterday I, I said, well, I'm about, what, 30 centimeters across right here, right? So I want you to, and, and I had told you, well, if we had a, an x-ray beam that had a, about 60 
KEV, it was 10 half value layers to grow across my pelvis there. And so only one out of a thousand x-rays was making it through unaffected in doing that. But let's do that same kind of thought experiment with the breast, okay? Let's compress the breast. And I want to say that the soft tissue in breast for an x-ray beam, which is now about 20 keV, so much lower than the one we were talking about yesterday, 20 keV, the half value layer is in the range of about 15 millimeters, 1.5 centimeters. So think if the breast is compressed to uh, 4.5 centimeters, right? So that's three half value layers. So now one out of every eight x-rays is making it through as a primary, as opposed to one in a thousand. Okay. If we can only get that breast to compress to six centimeters, well now we've got four half value layers. So that's one in 16 instead of one in eight, right? That's a big difference, right? So, so compression is crucial to us in terms of really minimizing the exposure to that breast while maximizing the amount of radiation we actually end up getting in the detector. So mammography is some of the lowest noise imaging. It is the lowest noise radiographic imaging that we do for the reason that I just talked about, okay? It's not, oh, the breast gets a really high dose and that's why we have no, no low noise. It's that we've compressed the breast to be nice and thin. So now the vast majority of the x-rays, well, it's, it's one eighth is still not a majority. So many more of those x-rays make it through than they do in other types of imaging. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's that dose, right? We, we want to have low dose because the breast is fairly radiosensitive and we've got to balance that with those resolution, contrast, and noise requirements. And here are all those things I've already mentioned. We've got to achieve that through the appropriate selection of all of those things. So how does this equipment differ from some of the other equipment and how do these parameters differ? Well, in terms of um, the X-ray tube, Right? That standard x-ray tube with a focal spot of either six-tenths of a millimeter or closer to 1.2 millimeters, that focal spot is too big. That system doesn't have the resolution. We need something on the order of three-tenths of a millimeter or one-tenth of a millimeter for magnification views and mammography. And that'll give us uh, um, you know, these excellent spatial resolution properties to help detect those uh, um, microcalcifications. Our anode is also made out of a different material. Um, this has changed some with digital mammal. We're, we're going more and more with the tungsten anode. But, but when we were doing film, we either used a, a molybdenum or a rhodium anode. And the reason for that is the K edge for molybdenum is right around 20 keV. So we get a lot of nice characteristic x-ray production in that range. Um, and I'm going to show you a picture of why that's uh, important. Um, we get, you know, the greater percentage of those photoelectric effects occurring in the anode material, if you, if you will, and th thus we get the, that, that better contrast. The focal spot we mentioned, we talked about the importance of the, the resolution. We're going to use a lower KV technique, right? We talked about the fact that if we want more photoelectric, we really need to work with lower KEV x-rays. So, we want them to be uh, above the K edge of the target material because if they're not above the K edge of the target material, we're not going to get that characteristic X-ray production, right? You've got to have your energy be higher than the K-shell binding energy of your target material to get characteristic X-ray production. Higher KV, if we go up a little bit higher, it's going to decrease our contrast, but typically we have a setting that allows us to do that in case we've got a thicker, denser breast, a breast that won't allow us to do as much compression as we would like to do. Our milliamp range is typically much lower. Remember we talked about about a thousand milliamps, one amp kind of range for yesterday for a lot of x-ray imaging. So here about one-tenth that. And if you multiply those two together, you notice that the tube power from a mammography x-ray tube is much, much lower than it was for the conventional radiography tube, right? It's about uh, 30 times, 40 times lower than that in terms of its power consumption.
Because the output of the tube is so much lower, imaging times in mammography are quite a bit longer. It usually takes a second to acquire um, a mammography view, sometimes up to two, and some of the magnification views can take up to three seconds exposure time. Um, and that's important because there's a lot of chance for motion to occur and blur the image. So compression plays another important role in really kind of minimizing the motion of the breast during that. The other thing you should think about is the, the filtration. Even a glass housing on the x-ray tube would start to reduce the number of those low energy 18 keV kind of range x-rays than we would want. So instead there's a little beryllium window, right? Very low Z material on there so that the x-ray beam is minimally attenuated as it comes out of the tube. There's usually a little bit of added filtration because you do want to get rid of those very low energy x-rays, you know, the ones on the order of 2 and 3 keV because they're never going to make it through the breast. So they're only going to add to dose uh, to the patient. So we want to get rid of, rid of those. And it's really nice if we'll match the filtration to the anode material. So if we'll use a molybdenum anode with a molybdenum filter, it really gives us some really nice characteristics in terms of the shape of the x-ray beam that we end up creating, and I'll show you that in a second. By the way, thin molybdenum or thin rhodium, 25 to 30 microns, um, approximately has a half value layer of three-tenths of a millimeter of aluminum, right? That's on the order of one-tenth the amount of filtration that we ha had before. So here's why we like that filter matching the anode material. So remember when we talked yesterday, right, the Bremstralong, unfiltered Bremstralong would just look something like that, right? It would look like a, a straight line, and if this is 25 kVp put on the x-ray tube, the maximum energy x-ray that we'd create would be 25 keV right here. And these are the characteristic x-ray peaks for molybdenum. And notice, though, because we have a little bit of uh, filtration from the beryllium window itself, that these lower things are knocked, energy things are knocked out. So we don't have that straight line appearance that we talked about here. But now remember what happens if we'll add a little bit of um, molybdenum filtration. Does everyone see, remember, the K edge for molybdenum is right about here, right? It's got to be slightly higher than where these peaks are because those peaks are the difference between the K and L shell binding energies. So it sits right up here. And so now for X-ray energies, for X-ray energy slightly higher than that, molybdenum actually is a better stopper of those X-ray energies than it is for ones just lower than that. Does everyone remember that little discontinuity in our curve that showed our attenuation properties, where it jumped up right at the K-shell um, uh, binding energy? So it really knocks down the X-ray energies just above that level. Does everyone see that? It also, of course, reduces some of the x-rays, the lower energy ones that were down here. So notice there's some reduction in the shape of the beam here. And I'm a little bit disappointed in this picture because in reality, it should show this peak being slightly lower than it is over here and this peak being slightly lower. If you put a filter in front of the x-ray beam, it is going to decrease the number of all x-rays. It may decrease some less than others, but it's going to decrease all of them. So, so I don't like that about this picture. I think it could be drawn a little bit better. Does everyone see that this almost gives us a really nice narrow range of X-ray energies in which to do our breast imaging. And, and in fact, if we could do monochromatic imaging, it re we really get excellent results in terms of the quality of our imaging. And that's what this um, X-ray shaping, right? This X-ray beam shaping that we're trying to accomplish with this. And this is nice because in the old screen film days, this really allowed us to get an energy level that matched really well with the film system that we were using, the screen film system that we were using. In digital imaging, we're not using molybdenum uh, as a anode as much anymore. We're going more and more to tungsten, which means we get no characteristic x-ray um, production, right? Because the K 
shell energy for tungsten is much higher than the KV that we're typically going to put across the tube, 25 to 30 K KVP. Um, the, the, en the energy that corresponds to that is much higher. So, so we don't get that as much. And that's in part because we've got some much wider dynamic range to work with in CR that we can sacrifice a little bit of our contrast in uh, digital imaging, okay? What about compression? We talked about the importance of using it to, to really get that breast tissue spread out and fairly thin so we minimize the amount of scatter. And we're able to keep our dose as low as possible. It reduces any blur due, due to parallax, right? Things that are in different planes, even if they were the same size, if they're different depths in the breast, they're gonna appear slightly larger. And the more we can, the thinner we can make the breast in compression, the less that has an effect. It spreads out the breast tissue also. When you compress, so now there's less overlapping structures to help find uh, some of the, the pathology. And the importance is to it immobilizes the breast, right? We talked about the long exposure times. We've got to make it out of a very low density but very stiff material to be able to do a good job with that, right? It can't, it's a filter in, if you think about it, right? We're putting it between the x-ray beam and the patient. And so we've got to make it out of a very low Z material so it minimally attenuates the x-ray beam. You know, the b b drawback is patient discomfort. And I, I should just say patient pain, right? Because discomfort is a physician's euphemism for pain, right? Uh, this 25 to 40 pounds of compression during mammography, uh, a lot of patients find more than uncomfortable. Here's, here's some motion on a mammogram obtained, right? And here's the reshot of that. And it's, it's very, motion is very subtle in mammography. I can remember being a resident on mammography surface, service and you know, the first couple of times the attending said to me, oh, there's, that's some motion on that exam. We need to get it repeated. I'm, I'm staring at it, wondering how, how do you see that? But that subtle blurring that we see on that image from the motion there in that patient with DCIS. We use grids in mammography that helps use, reduce some of the scatter, and of course we already know that reducing scatter improves our image contrast. It's certainly more important with the thicker breast. Uh, the grid reciprocates, it moves so that we don't see any kind of line pattern again, right? It vibrates back and forth a little bit. It's a carbon fiber construction because we're working again at much lower X-ray energies. Uh, it turns out it doubles the radiation dose, so um, grids in mammography have a bucky factor of about two. Um, and we don't use them with the magnification views because in magnification views we have an air gap and we talked about how air gaps help us um, minimize uh, the effect uh, of scatter. So just looking at the imaging geometry uh, for both uh, conventional mammography and then magnification and then reminding ourselves of the heel effect that we talked about on these next few slides. So here we are, this distance from the focal spot to the detector is about 65 centimeters, so much closer than it is for a lot of other x-ray imaging. And that's important because, remember, the output of these tubes are much lower because we've got this really false, small focal spots. And so if you moved further away, because of the R squared law, now your x-ray intensity would be much lower and your imaging times would have to go up even higher. Um, I mentioned that was about 65 centimeters. We certainly want to get the object as close to the detector as possible. Again, that's good compression. Um, object closer to the detector, of course, have less magnification, right? The closer this object was, would be to the detector, the less it would be magnified on the view. And here's magnification mammography, right? Instead, we stand everything off of the detector and we image in a similar sort of way. Turns out that we stand it off so that the source to image distance, the source to object distance are 65 and 35 centimeters respectively. So if you use similar triangles and look back at the picture I just made, your magnification is roughly about two times on our magnification views in mammography. We use that air gap to eliminate the scatter and therefore we don't use the grid. And that way we don't have to, right, with magnification, just like we talked about in fluoro, you've got to bump up the dose when you do a magnification. But here, since we've popped the grid out, we can actually get away with keeping the dose about the same, okay? And then we talked about the heel effect, how the cathode side of the x-ray tube is a bit more intense, I'm sorry, the x-ray beam is a bit more intense than the anode side, and so therefore the cathode side of the tube is always the thing that's up against the chest wall where the breast is a little bit thicker. <clears throat> 
I want to mention, I think um, estimates last year, year before, were still that about 5%, between 5 and 10% of systems in the U.S. were, were still screen film for MAMO. Um, I'm sure that's rapid, still rapidly decreasing, but I'm going to just mention a couple things about screen film and, and then a little bit about digital. We've talked about both, but I want to just mention a couple things specific to mammography. In screen film, we use a single screen, sim single emulsion setup for mammography. This gives better resolution than the setup in conventional uh, screen film imaging. Uh, it gives us a little bit de decreased detection efficiency. We also use a very high gradient, low latitude film, and I'll show you a picture of what we mean that. High gradient films get really good contrast. Low latitude film means that they on, the film only works well over a very narrow range of exposures, but since we have soft tissue structures that we've compressed to a fairly uniform thickness, we can work over a small range of exposures. Unlike a chest radiograph where you've got some mediastinal soft tissues and bone and aerated lung, and you've got to have a, a film which tolerates a much wider range of exposures. So here, here's general screen film set up in, in general radiography, x-ray of the abdomen, x-ray pills, right? You have this screen material that converts our x-ray into light. Of course, some x-rays come all the way through that and come through the emulsion and mylar base. The emulsion, remember, is that silver halide that gets exposed. And so we put a screen on the backside as well. So if this x-ray comes through, it may interact with the second screen and do that. Well, remember that this screen, if the x-ray interacts here, we're going to get quite a little bit of blurring because this light spreads out over a fairly far distance. And frankly, the most likely place for an x-ray to interact, it's more likely that the x-ray is going to interact on this superficial layer. I mean, if you think about it, if 10% of the x-rays interact on average in the first, you know, tenth of the thickness of this screen, well... <sighs> that once we get to the next layer, there's only 90% of them left to interact there. So a f the, fir the deeper you go, the fewer that are going to interact. So that's problematic because of this spread out and this blurring that occurs here. So in mammography, we go with the single screen system, right? And so now when something comes through and interacts, it's really close to the emulsion, right? So a single screen uh, system there. And unfortunately, because you only have the single screen, more likely that more x-rays are going to pass through without interacting. So our efficiency goes down with a single screen system, but our resolution properties are much better. Does that make sense to everyone? So just a little something about, about screens there. Right, here's, when we, we image with film, here's the underexposure range. I've showed you that before where you didn't have enough radiation to adequately expose the film. Here's the overexposure range where you just use too much radiation and now the film is just completely whited out in um, uh, that area. Uh, and here's the range, the workable range for that. Now in mammography, we really are going to only expose over a very narrow range. So this, this curve is going to be really steep. Um, that latitude, remember, we talked about is going to be uh, uh, quite small. And basically all that's saying is for very small differences in exposure, we get big differences in the apparent brightness on the film. And that's what we want for mammography. What about digital mammography? Well, we need much better resolution than we do, right? If you want to go find the most expensive and the best uh, PAX monitors in the department, head over to the mammography department because they've got minimum five megapixel monitors and more likely they have eight megapixel monitors in this day and age. Um, still poor resolution than film, but good enough right at this 80 micron or so to see those small one-tenth of a millimeter, 0.15 millimeter microcalcifications that we need. We need a higher dynamic range. It has to be able to show variations in uh, intensity on the film much better uh, than some of the conventional monitors. Um, the X-ray spectra I talked about, we tend to use this tungsten target rather than molybdenum or rhodium. Because the average KV tends to be a little bit higher, we actually can actually get by with a little bit less dose to the breast. We have sacrificed a little bit of our contrast, but remember, based on that picture I showed you, our contrast properties of digital imaging, we've got that nice linear response over that wider range. 
So same patient, uh, about a year apart, um, just magnified images of their unedited digital memo and their unedited edited screen film memo uh, of the same region on the breast. And by the way, remember we talked about that little K factor that you can use to adjust the contrast in an image uh, when you do radiography, and I said that's why digital imaging is not contrast limited. In mammography, that K value is actually changed in different regions of the image. And that's why on digital mammo, you can see the skin edge, right? The K is set differently in this region, which is more highly exposed than the region here. And some of the, when I was in training, that's when digital came into its first use. We switched over to digital while I was actually resident. And some of the older mammographers actually hated this effect, right, when digital first came about because they were so much more used to this appearance. They felt like this was, this was artifactual. And I think most people who learn to read digital mammography to start with actually really prefer that appearance, right? You can see those structures. They're not as burnt out on the image much better. Some nice calcifications here. Just an example where I think you can see those a little bit better on the digital image uh, than on the screen film image. Here's what we were talking about, right? That nice linear response over a very wide range for CRDR compared to some of the, the film, uh, screen film systems. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit here about tomosynthesis. I just want to talk a little bit about the basic principle of tomosynthesis, right? In tomosynthesis, we're going to rotate the x-ray tube over a relatively small arc. We're not going to rotate it 360 degrees around the breast like we do in CT. We're going to use a little bit of a limited arc. And that's going to allow us to make reconstructions of the breast in planes that kind of parallel that arc. So we could get nice reconstructions in this plane. If we wanted to get reconstructions in that plane, we couldn't do that from this tomographic data set. And that's why we do tomograms in both the CC and the MLO view, because in order to get tomograms, if you will, in this plane, we really have to make the arc be kind of paralleling that axis of the breast there. So how does that work? You know, we go and take an image there, and then we take an image there, and then we take an image there, and usually there's in the neighborhood of oh, 15, 30 or so images, low um, dose images taken across that. So there are the images that are created. Notice these two structures are gonna project slightly differently depending on where that x-ray tube was. And it turns out if we'll shift each of these images with respect to the other, and then sum the images up, we can get a better image of a particular slice. So for instance, for this slice in the image, I need to know the appropriate amount to shift image one, to shift image two, and shift image three. And if I shift those by their appropriate amount and add them together, I get a summation image which shows that benign cyst-like structure in its plane very nicely. And then if I want to reconstruct this slice, well then the shift is a different value. The shifting that we do to the image is different, and then I add those images together and I get this image that shows that you know, tumor um, much nicer uh, in that plane. And we can still see the other structures in the breast. They're just blurred out of that plane slightly with this technique. So he, here's a, a pair, a CC and an MLO kind of tomo image of the breast. They really have a little bit different kind of texture to, to them. And usually we make a, a stack of about 40, 45 of these that you need to scroll through to evaluate that. Well, in terms of radiation dose to the breast, average glandular dose, uh, minimizing uh, patient dose, uh, the risk of radiation uh, versus the benefits of screening. You know, there, there are regulations out there. The, the ACR requires that less than three milligrays per view with the grid in place, uh, less than one without the grid in place. Um, the dose, and, and we're going to talk about radiation biology tomorrow and talk a little bit about uh, what these measurements mean. It's approximately uh, 0.4 millisieverts, approximately equal to, to four chest x-rays or so for each view, okay? And this is from the UK. Uh, this isn't from the U.S. They kind of grade everything into negligible risk, minimal risk. So here's chest, hand, foot x-rays. Here's skull, neck x-rays in the minimal risk category. And they put mammography in the very low risk category along with hip kind of pelvis x-ray kind of range there. The truth is we don't really know. You know, we don't, we don't have great data 
to know what the risk of minimal doses of radiation are. We make some assumptions based on the risk that we see at higher dose. We extrapolate to figure out what those are. And that table that I just showed you uses those assumptions to, to suggest that that's where the risk falls. Right, so, you know, the prudent thing to do is to assume that there's some risk when you don't know, right? Let's assume that there's some risk and therefore we'll do everything we can to keep that risk as small as possible. So we'll make sure we really pay attention to our technique, our KVN or MAS. We make, uh, pay attention to our compression. We minimize any repeat views and of course quality control through M MQSA. And frankly, right, you can't do uh, mammography without uh, MQSA. This is a really difficult question, like I said, even on a population basis, right, to know what the risk of radiation dose versus the risk of screening is. And it's certainly, it's impossible to assess on the individual level. Um, in randomized control trials, you know, women just age 40 to 74, screening mammography is associated with somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent relative reduction in mortality due to breast CA. Again, those different studies get some slightly different numbers. You know, controversy still exists for certain age groups and demographics. Um, what about viewing? We need, if we're going to do screen film, we need some high luminescence view boxes, right? We, these are, those old view boxes were twice as bright as the conventional view box. We need a hot light and a magnifying glass, essential, and really low ambient light in the room. The darkest reading rooms in, in your site are the mammography reading rooms. In digital, we need m monitors that really can produce a much greater brightness, a great, much greater width of brightness uh, than a range of brightnesses, if you will, than conventional monitors. We talked about how many, the five megapixel or eight megapixel monitors. We've got to have a bit depth of at least eight pixels, 256 gray levels. We've got to be able to display images at true size. By the way, images at true size are much bigger than this, which means you've got to be magnifying your images when you do mammography. Uh, and we need four of these, right? We've got to be able to look at all four images uh, simultaneously. Um, these images are huge. They're the largest studies that we deal with, okay? And I'm, t I'm talking about compared to CT. If you have to send a four-view mammographic series with its comparison across the network, you're sending much more data than if you're sending 800 images from a CT that are, you know, reconstructed at 512 by 512. Um, We've got to have our tools for windowing, measuring, labeling, uh, integration with CAD. I'm just going to mention a little bit of CAD. You know, CAD does some, a great job detecting some lesions very well, like microcalcifications, not so great at others. It is getting better. Um, you know, it's designed for use with radiologists, not independent interpretation. There's some evidence out there that suggests that dedicated breast imagers benefit from CAD much less than non-dedicated breast imagers. And, and the evidence out there shows that it definitely influences performance, but there's still a question as to how much it improves performance. You know, one of the issues people have mentioned with CAD, do people then not look at images as closely because they think, well, I've got my, my CADs backing me up here kind of thing. So we still don't know some of that. In terms of ensuring safety and quality, the Mammography Quality Standards Act, right, it, it sets forth certain requirements that have to be met if you want to provide mammography services. There are personnel requirements for the physician, for a physicist and a technologist. A physician has to be the responsible party for making sure that all of those things occur. Okay. There are certain things that you have to be able to meet in terms of the dose limits, the ACR phantom. Um, and if you're going to be uh, MQSA eligible, MQSA sets those standards, but it also says that certain organizations can act on their behalf to accredit you to do mammography. In other words, they meet all of MQSA's requirements in, term of, in terms of what they're doing. And the ACR is one of them. As a matter of fact, ACR's requirements are a bit more strict than what MQSA requires. MQSA was developed in 1992 basically to insist on having a national standard of quality in mammography. Um, states can impose more stringent requirements, but they cannot have more lax requirements than that. And it's illegal to perform mammography, as I mentioned, without that FDA MQSA certification. ACR is an accredited body. Some of the states have their own accreditation bodies uh, there. 
Um, you have to meet those standards. We already mentioned personnel, equipment, maximum allowable radiation dose, quality assurance, medical audit and outcomes analysis, right? You have to look at what your false positive rate is. You really have to follow up on your cancers. Um, and you, you have to be accredited either by ACR or one of the four states as part of, to meet those MQSA requirements. Um, to maintain that certification, you've got to maintain that accreditation with that accreditation body. There's an annual survey by a medical uh, physicist who will come by. Uh, there's an MQSA inspector who will come by. Of course, you have to pay your inspection fee. And then any deficiencies that are found during that process basically have to get corrected immediately. Otherwise, you have to stop performing uh, mammography. I'm not going to go into these. You guys are familiar with some of the physician requirements, what experience you need to be able to, to read mammography. There is a requirement for new modality training, the amount of studies that you see um, to maintain your certification. There's requirements for the physicist, and notice they also are required to go through new modality training, and for the technologist. Um, so when it's something new like tomosynthesis comes about, you have to get training in that area. Here's the ACR Phantom. It has six of these fibers, some spec groups, and some masses. Here's an image of that Phantom, um, and you can see all of those very nicely. The ACR requires that your average glandular dose for a 4.2 centimeter breast, uh, like I said, be less than three milligray per image without the grid, less than one, I'm sorry, with the grid, less than one without the grid. And if you image that Phantom, you've gotta be able to see at least uh, five of the spec groups and five of the masses uh, to, to um, be accredited. Uh, and I, I think I've run past time a little bit, so I'm not going to read that slide to you, and I think that's the end of the mammography talk. Th thanks, everyone, and I'll hang around a little bit if there are any questions.